Welcome back, wonderfuls, and welcome new ICW family members. There are so many new faces in our community, and we we are just so thrilled to have you here with us and that you said yes to this journey with us. So welcome, welcome. Now, as many of you know, this is a huge month for me, and I just love that I get to share it with you. So Valentine's Day marks my 20 year cancerversary. 20 years. I can't even believe it myself. 20 years of living and thriving with stage four cancer. Now, to be honest, I did not always believe that I would make it this far, especially when I was initially given 10 years to live. So this is a big celebration. I am here today to celebrate myself, to celebrate you, to connect, and to share a few tools that I have learned on my journey to help me weather difficult storms. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. How do we weather these storms? Because like it or not, they're gonna come. And so we're gonna explore all of that. Now, our theme this month is living courageously. And today's coaching topic is thriving in hardship. So as we always do, we're gonna start with our opening practices. That means we're gonna do some breathing, together and we're gonna set an intention. So go ahead and get comfortable, uncross your legs, get cozy in your chair, on your sofa or in your bed, wherever you are. Close your eyes and we're gonna take a few deep breaths together, in through the nose and out through the mouth. Okay, let's start. And inhale. Exhale. Inhale, exhale, one more time, inhale, and exhale, keeping your eyes closed, may we trust in our mental and our physical resilience. And may we believe in our ability to not only weather storms, but to thrive despite them. Whenever you're ready, open your eyes. <laughs> so, have you ever had a moment of seeing your worst fears realized? life crumbling into a million pieces, a situation that is so intense that you're positive it cannot be fixed. And if by some miracle you can make it better, well, you will surely never be the same. I think we've all had experiences like that. So if you're nodding your head, <laughs> you're not alone. And this is what I call the rupture. And ruptures come in all shapes and sizes. Getting fired from a job, losing a close friendship for no discernible reason, right? Financial instability that leads to dramatic life changes. A loved one's health diagnosis, your own diagnosis, and so on. So having had multiple uh, ruptures in my own life, I know this shock and I know this uncertainty and I know all of the emotions that come with it really well. And yet, even the worst ruptures, what I have learned is that they can reveal a guide map to our next chapter. So if it wasn't for my cancer diagnosis, there's a lot of things that would not have happened in my life. I wouldn't have found my husband. I wouldn't have started the work that I do now that I love so dearly. I wouldn't be here with you today, right? And so on, lots of things. Now, I am not saying that the rupture was a gift, but I am saying that there can be blessings and insights that lead to a more meaningful life and adjustments that can come that are really helpful in our lives as a result of these ruptures. 
Or as my grandmother used to say and remind me, uh, she'd say, don't curse the darkness, light a candle. So with that, I want to step through some tips to help us navigate the darkness. So here's what you're going to learn in this month's coaching. How to ask a better question. Why you need to give yourself permission to feel your feelings, especially if you don't want to. And how getting out of your head and into your body can be a life preserver. So let's dive in, my friends. All right. Number one, the question. What is the question that we want to ask ourselves? Well, the question isn't why. It's what. Right? So often we start with why. Why me? Why this? Why now? Why, why, why? So the difficult thing about getting caught up in why something happened is that that question is rarely answered. And yet it is hard for us humans to accept that there are so many things in life that we don't know, that we can't know, that we may never know. Instead, we like to fill in the mystery, right? With our own clever and very overactive imaginations. So in fact, our brain is designed to look at the past, right? It looks at the past and it scans for clues. And those clues help our brain create a risk assessment. Basically, it can help us say, okay, based on all this, what's my risk in the future? And how can I stay safe? If I understand the risks, how can I stay safe in the present, right? It makes sense but sometimes it can go awry, right? So here's the problem. When our brain doesn't have enough data, it gets anxious. It gets super anxious as it's scanning, right? And it starts to make stuff up. So in the early days of my own diagnosis, I wondered, what have I done to cause cancer? What have I done? Was I too stressed out? Was I too angry? Was I too moody? Did I eat too much sugar? Did I eat too many processed foods? Did I bum too many cigarettes in the 90s, right? Was it karma for sending the adult sex toy catalog to my very uptight school principal who, for whatever reason, was always after me, was always mad at me for something? (laughs) I did that. But the point is here is if I could only figure out why cancer was in my body, well, then maybe I could stop it. And look, this is a very reasonable desire. This is very reasonable. And many of us who have lived through a diagnosis or something that is just very life-changing, of course, we want to know why. And it's not to say that there aren't positive things that can come from the why that could then make our lives healthier, better, more productive, in the future. But if we're not careful, and certainly back then, if I wasn't careful, I could easily start blaming myself and beating myself up. And that's why I bring this up, because the why can take us there very quickly, which only, what does it do? It only harms our mental health and it gets in the way of our healing. So the truth is, (laughs) we may never know why. Or we may not know why someone we love gets sick, right? Why our partner decides to leave. Why we get laid off from our dream job. Why our BFF suddenly becomes distant. Why a seemingly good financial investment goes south. Why, 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 and so on, right? And assigning blame may make us feel like we have some degree of control, right, in the moment. Well, if it's my fault, then I can change something about it, okay? We only have that degree of control for like five seconds because ultimately, and it's all in our heads, because ultimately blame is the last thing that deserves to take up really valuable space in your mind. Survival demands that we don't get stuck looking back or spinning our wheels with worry about the future or beating ourselves up with a bunch of shoulds. Oh gosh, the shoulds, guys. I like to call the shoulds the shoulda, woulda, couldas. How many of you have had shoulda, woulda, coulda moments that just like 
man, they just ring us out. So I should have taken better care of myself. I should have caught this sooner. I would have done things differently if only I knew. I should have shown up more for this person and so on. Now, to some degree, the shoulda, woulda, couldas are normal. Right? Who hasn't been a Monday morning quarterback analyzing better outcomes in retrospect? Right? We all do it. But when left unchecked, Monday morning quarterbacking makes it harder to pick up the pieces and move forward. And that is because a retrospective focus, if we're only focused on the past, we are stuck in that un changeable past. Yeah, I should have done all those things, but the facts are clear. I didn't, and there's nothing I can do about it now. So what can I do? Not beat myself up, not make myself feel guilty or ashamed because of the things that I didn't do, right? So in the decades since my diagnosis, I have learned a better question to ask, and that question is what? What is the better question, okay? Ask yourself, what? For example, what's going on in my body when I have these really anxious thoughts? Well, I can feel my heart race, I start to sweat, I, don't, I'm, I struggle having a good night's sleep and so on, right? Another what question is, what part of my body feels the most scared or anxious when I'm in this place, okay? What part of my body? Um, for some of you, it might be your throat. Others, it might be your chest. For me, it's often my stomach. Right? And when my stomach is in knots all the time, what does that do? It messes with my digestion. What does that do? It messes with my immunity. It messes with my joy. Right. So what part of my body feels the most anxious when I can understand that I can help that part of the body? What can I do to support myself right now? Okay, I can take deep breaths. I can talk to my therapist. I can get a better doctor. I can forgive myself and so on. So what helps us de-escalate our worries in healthy ways, right? When we let go of the why and we zero in on the what, as in what do you most need right now to feel supported, well, what happens is, is your nervous system starts to calm down. Right? And we have the chance to become more present. We have the chance to become more adaptable. We have the chance to become more at ease with life's natural currents. And best of all, we're more capable of forgiving ourselves, of forgiving others, and of forgiving life itself. Okay? Which brings me to number two. Give yourself permission to feel your feelings. So when you're going through a rupture of any kind, it is so easy to think that if you allow yourself to feel your feelings, you're going to totally fall apart. The opposite is true, as many of you know, but it can still feel that way and it can be terrifying. And guess what? Pain doesn't occur in isolation. So let's talk about grief, for example. One loss often brings up past losses, even ones that we may think that we're over. That was so long ago. I processed that. I talked that through. I forgave that person. I'm good. I'm so good. And all of a sudden, you lose something. Your life changes. You go through a huge rupture. And guess what's triggered? That old stuff. So whether we're conscious of it or not, we're not just grieving something that's just happened. We're not just grieving our present loss. But oftentimes, we're grieving the other losses and the other traumas that came before it. I think I shared this in the boot camp recently, um, but my therapist has a great saying that really helped me during the process of, of exploring my own grief and, and writing the book that I'm writing and finishing that will come out in the fall. She says, when the grief train pulls into the station, it brings all the cars, okay? Brings all the cars. So no wonder grief specifically can be really scary 
and really exhausting. That's because it rips us open, dislodging a backlog of old grief in the process. And together, those old um, aches and the fresh despair feel like a tsunami of emotions that will just drain our very life force if we don't do our best to try to protect ourselves, to hold it back, to push it down for fear that we're just gonna totally fall apart. And if we're not conscious of it, guess what happens, right? We're doing all that, we're pushing it down. And what happens, those pains, they start to stack up right on top of each other. And when that happens, it, you know, it messes with our mental health, it messes with our physical health, it messes with our emotional resilience, and so on. There's a real domino effect when we start to stuff. Okay, so in reality, allowing ourselves to feel our pain is how we ultimately, ultimately start to feel better again. It's how we ultimately start to feel more fully alive again, right? It takes a lot of courage to feel our pain. It takes a lot of courage to trust that we are capable of feeling our pain. But your heart is vast. Your capacity to live and feel and breathe it all is also vast. And it is that trust that we need to lean on more than anything. And if you don't feel like you have that trust right now, then what I know you can lean on is courage, right? I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not sure I trust myself the way Chris says that I, I might, but... I can choose to courageously try to trust myself, to lean into these experiences, to get the support that I need so that I can start to feel better by not stuffing my emotions. Because the more we stuff our emotions, ultimately, the more we stuff our needs, okay? So here's the other thing. We may never get over what happened in our rupture, but over time, we become more adept at breathing, at living life again, living it fully, and moving forward, right? Okay, so, plus the act of holding in those stacked emotions is equally painful, as many of you know, right? It's painful. I talked about this in the boot camp recently, but imagine it like holding back a wave, right? You've got a big wave out there, and you see that it's going to hit, right? You're going to get hit by that emotional wave and you know that it is not going to feel good. It's going to be painful. It's going to be terrifying. It's going to break your heart. So what do you do? You stretch out your arms to try to hold it back. But you know you can't hold back the wave, right? What, do you, what happens when you try to hold back the wave is it drains you, it exhausts you, and it makes you feel worse. But you can't hold it back forever and eventually it is going to hit. And the more we are holding it back and stacking that pain, the harder it is when it hits. The only way forward is through that wave. So when tough emotions hit, one of the most in important and compassionate and loving ways that we can meet them is honestly with the breath. It's how we start every single ICW coaching, by connecting with our breath, connecting with ourselves, connecting with our spirit. So let's do a little bit more breath work together right now. Go ahead and gently close your eyes again. Good, good, good. And I want you to put one hand on your heart and the other hand on your belly. Whichever hand feels good on your heart, use that. I'm gonna choose my right hand. You may choose your left hand. One hand on your heart, one hand on your belly, okay? Now I want you to consciously shift your breathing so that your belly is rising and falling. Oftentimes we breathe into our chest. Many of us are shallow breathers and what I want to encourage you to do is just breathe deeply into your belly. Oh, letting it relax, letting it rise, and letting it fall. And just keep going on your own. Breathing into your belly. Good, good, good. Allowing it to rise, allowing it to fall, 
allowing each breath to calm your nervous system and to send a signal to your body, letting you know that you are safe. You are right here, right now. You are okay. If your mind drifts to what, whatever you're feeling, whatever is giving you stress, if your mind drifts to that place, you can feel free to use my mantra as you're breathing deeply into your belly. As that emotion starts to come up, maybe those emotions are starting to loosen up because you're just taking a moment to actually breathe. And as you feel yourself feeling safer or even saying to yourself, I feel safe, maybe that brings up emotions. Maybe it brings up sadness for the times you haven't felt safe. Maybe there's something happening in the future coming up that you're really worried about. And so when you think about it, you feel very triggered and it's hard to be in the present moment. Whenever that happens, come back to the breath, right? The breath grounds us in the now. Whenever I find myself on those mental trips, using my breath, I rely on a little mantra that I've come up with for myself and it's this. It's nothing until it's something. It's nothing until it's something. And it may not be anything. It's nothing until it's something and it may not be anything. But all I can do right now is be in this moment. Future tripping does me no good. So I come back to the breath. I come back to this moment. I come back to feeling my feet on the ground, my butt on the chair, being present with all of you in this coaching. Back to the breath. Allowing your belly to rise and fall. Beautiful, everyone. And whenever you're ready, open your eyes and welcome back. It's powerful stuff, right? Such good medicine that is free to all of us. Just using the breath and bringing ourselves back to the present. Saying, oh, 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 I see where you're going. There's nothing good for you there. Come back here now. Okay, so one more thing is let's explore... No, as you explore your emotions, right? I want, I invite you to make a promise to yourself, okay? So as you explore your emotions, I want to invite you to make a promise to yourself. I'm going to invite you to repeat after me if this resonates with you. So here we go. I will not punish myself for my feelings. They're going to come up and you're not going to punish yourself for them. I will release myself from criticism over my past behaviors. I will remember that I am doing the best that I can. And I will move forward with love, okay? I will not punish myself for my feelings. I will release myself from criticisms over past behaviors. I will remember that I am doing the best that I can and I will move forward with love. Which brings me to number three. Get out of your head and into your body. So research shows that it is really hard to solve the problems of the mind, especially when your mind is like ruminating and freaking out. It's hard to solve the problems of the mind with the mind. Your mind is already offline, okay? You're cooked. So when we're flooded with fear and anxiety and worry, it can be really challenging to mentally strong arm ourselves back into calm. So we need help changing our mental channel so we can choose a better path forward. So here's an example. Maybe you've experienced this if you're a dog owner like I am. Have you ever watched a dog, maybe it's your dog, or you see a dog out in the world in brain rot, right? They are incessantly barking or they're incessantly licking a hot spot. Now, changing this behavior requires changing their physical state. Maybe 
you distract them by playing ball, right? It changes the channel in their mind or going for a walk or, you know, anything, going swimming, whatever your dog loves to do and so on. Sure, you can obviously shout at your dog. You've seen people do it. Maybe you've done it in the past. No, Fido, don't do that. But that doesn't always work. And even if it does work, yelling only makes dogs feel more anxious. Well, the same is true for you and me. Similarly, when we're anxious, shouting no at ourselves only makes things worse. So this is where movement comes in. It's one of our pillars in ICW. Remember, the five pillars of our wellness practice are being mindful of what you're eating, what you're drinking, what you're thinking, and how you're resting and renewing. And renewing is about movement and play. It's about getting into our bodies and getting into our lives. So changing your physical state helps you change your mental state too. It literally is like changing the channel. And even just 10 minutes of movement a day, so whether that's walking or roller skating or dancing or anything that you love that gets your heart pumping significantly reduces your stress and your anxiety. Moving our muscles also releases a chemical bath of feel-good hormones like serotonin and dopamine, right? So in summary, how are we going to navigate these difficult times? Because guess what? They're going to happen. These are just a few things that I have, you know, pulled out of my difficult times grab bag for you today. Obviously, there's a lot of other things that we can and we will explore. But let's repeat and recap what we've just stepped through. So the poop hits the fan. We're going to ask a better question. We're not going to get stuck in why. We're going to ask what we can do now. What? We're going to give ourselves permission to feel our feelings. Pushing them down, holding them back only shoves the issues into our tissues, making us break down physically emotionally and spiritually, right? We're gonna trust that we've got what it takes to feel those feelings. And when we doubt, we're gonna lean on courage, right? Number three, get out of our heads and into our bodies. We cannot solve the problems of the mind always with the mind. We need to change the channel by changing our physical state. And of course, as I mentioned, I wanna say one more time, trust yourself, okay? You've got what it takes to ride these waves and to survive these storms. And like it or not, those storms are natural, okay? We can't have the rainbow without the rain. I know, it's cliche, but that's the thing about cliches. They're true. So my knees are going to get scraped again. It's going to happen in the future. I'm going to fall down. I'm going to scrape those knees. I'm going to need some bandage. I'm going to need some help back up. And guess what? Same thing's going to happen to you. But together, we've got a whole bunch of healing tools, we got a whole bunch of spiritual band-aids, and we've got a whole bunch of love for each other. I am so blessed to be able to have this experience with you, to celebrate this monumental time in my life with you, and to share this incredible journey with you. So thank you for that. Now, as we wrap, again, these are just a few ideas to support you. And speaking of support, you don't have to do this alone. It's really hard to do this stuff alone. So I want you to consider reaching out to a therapist or a counselor or a very close friend if you are going through a rupture right now. And of course, as always, lean on your ICW community. We are here for you and we love you. And now I'm going to give us a little toast. It's really fancy. It's a glass of water. Our hydration toast, may my next 20 years be filled with more magic and may your next 20 years be filled with so much magic too. Mm. Uh, That's good. Thank you, everybody. I love you. I'll see you in the community.